Bonjour tout le monde. Well, hello everyone. I'm the program leader of IDRC's Governance and Justice Program. C'est vraiment un grand plaisir de vous de voir tous les It's a great pleasure to see all of you here today. I think we have a pretty dynamic group today. We're going to be having a very, very active and interesting discussion this morning. To IDRC, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the International Development Research Center and the other organizers of this event, the UN Population Fund, the UN Peacebuilding Support Office, uh, and Oxfam Quebec. Uh, the, these are the organizing uh, entities of our event today. Uh, our event, Engaging Youth for Resilient and Inclusive Societies, where we're going to be presenting the findings of the missing piece, which some of you would have seen sitting out on the literature table on your way in, which is the UN's report on youth peace and security. So I can see looking out here that we have a very diverse crowd today, and we're very happy to be able to welcome members of the Canadian public, uh, members of different uh, Canadian civil society organizations who are working on issues of youth and development. Uh, we also have uh, a number of Canadian government departments here today, including Global Affairs Canada, who was also one of the supporters and funders of uh, the Missing Peace Report. Uh, we also have people here from Public Safety, from Privy Council Office, so welcome to all of you. And then, of course, as always, welcome to our colleagues from academia and from university, students, researchers, activists, and to my own IDRC colleagues. Welcome to all of you. So I, just a few uh, housekeeping issues. I did want to let you know that we have simultaneous translation this morning, um, English, French, French, English. Uh, if you need um, an, uh, whatever you, I would call it an appareil, uh, if you need one, uh, we have some. So you can speak to our technicians over here, and uh, they will give you um, a small translation device. Um, I also wanted to mention that we will be photographing and recording today's um, event uh, to put it up later on YouTube. So if there is anyone who is not comfortable with having their photograph taken, please um, do uh, let one of um, our organizers know, myself or my colleague Emma Suarez over here in the corner, and we would of course be happy to, to accommodate that. Um, so I really just want to kick off our event with um, a, a motivational video which was uh, shared uh, with us by Oxfam Quebec um, with support from Global Affairs Canada. Um, this video is about young Palestinians and it's going to give you a little bit of insight and a bit of a flavor of the very innovative methodology um, and process that went into uh, putting together the missing uh, peace report. So, I have to confess that I'm not sure if the video just magically comes on, or there we go. أنا من وجهة نظري إنه الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وعملية الانقسام التي حدثت مؤخرا هي أول المشاكل وهي العامل الرئيسي اللي سبب العديد من المشكلات لدى الشعب الفلسطيني وخاصة لشريحة الشباب بعتقد إنه هو أفرز إلنا الاحتلال الإسرائيلي والانقسام أفرز إلنا العديد من المشكلات الخاصة بفئة الشباب. إشراك الشباب في عمليات صنع القرار الحفاظ على السلم الأهلي وعمليات أمن في المناطق التي تنشب فيها صراعات وانضمام الشباب إلى المجمعات الإرهابية 
إذا غياب نسبة تمثيل الشباب وتعطل العملية الديمقراطية هي من أكبر الأسباب المحبطة لعدم تطبيق قرار الأمم المتحدة 2250 يتخذ النظام السياسي الفلسطيني بحاجة ماسة إلى قرار 2250 القائم على إشراك الشباب في عملية صنع القرار وأن النظام السياسي الفلسطيني القائم على ضعف تمثيل الشباب هو بدعم الشباب بشكل أساسي بدعم وجودهم بعزز دورهم الإيجابي بالمجتمع السلطة الفلسطينية أنه هي طبقه هيعدل في كثير أشياء ممكن أنه هو يكون بداية لحل المشكلة السياسية اللي احنا بنعاني منها من سنين ولو حتى الآن ما توصلناش لحل من خلال تعزيز دور الشباب لازم القيادات الفلسطينية تؤمن بحق الشباب في المشاركة السياسية وتؤمن في حق الشباب في إشراكهم في عملية حتى حتى عملية المصالحة إشراكهم في في عملية التفاوض ما بين اللي هو حزبين القسام فتح وحماس ثاني شيء إنه أنا مطالب إنه يكون هناك كوتا معينة للشباب الفلسطيني في مراكز صنع القرار يكونوا ممثلين. ويوصلوا رسالة الشاب الفلسطيني في الشارع الفلسطيني لأصحاب القيادات في مراكز صنع القرار نعمل الحملات ضغط ومناصرة من خلال هذا القرار من أجل أنه إحنا نطالب بمشاركة الشباب في الانتخابات من خلال تخفيض سن الترشيح للانتخابات التشريعية وجود متطلب جامعي في كل الجامعات يتحدث عن حقوق الشباب ودورهم وتبعيد دورهم في المجتمعات المحل المجتمع المدني خلال المؤسسات التعليمية أيضا يتم إتاحة الفرص للشباب وأطفالنا في الأدوار القيادية في في عمل هذه الأشياء التي تساعد الشباب على الشخصية القيادية ودور الريادي في المجتمع ومن هنا نطالب الجهات المسؤولة والسلطات المسؤولة بالضغط تجاه هذه المشكلة والعمل على حلها وفتح المعبر بشكل مستمر لتسهيل حرية السفر وإمكانية تبادل الخبرات بشكل مستمر إنه إحنا نخلق فرص عمل للشباب وكون في إنهم مجال يكون في تنمية حقيقية فعلية تساعد في التغيير وفي إدارة عجلة التنمية في المجتمع الفلسطيني Great uh, vote of thanks uh, for Oxfam to Oxfam for that very interesting video. The next part of our agenda, and uh, just give the floor to uh, Ariane Dahan, who is the director of the Inclusive Economies Program area here in IDRC. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I, my name is Ayanan. As Colleen said, I'm the director of the Inclusive Economies Program here at, uh, at IDRC. And, and, uh, and I very much look forward to the presentation. I'm going to be very brief in my, in my introduction. Uh, we, we had the pleasure to have a little bit of a preview of the, of the study. I've been reading it over, overnight. And, and this is a very important study. This is much more than, than, than just about, uh, about young, uh, young people. Uh, when you read the case studies that you hear about, you, you do get this feeling that, that this is a very important uh, moment where in many places in the world we're kind of a critical uh, juncture of, of uh, you get this feeling of the different directions in which, in which uh, uh, even, even stable societies uh, can go in post-conflict societies, in societies in, 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 in conflict. And, uh, and, and maybe it is a function of me getting older, but, but when 
you when you do read the studies and, and you do travel, you feel that there is a different dynamic. Some of it may be technology driven, that there is a greater awareness of the opportunities and the challenges uh, uh, challenges that that societies in those those fragile contexts uh, context face. And a focus on youth is 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 is, is, is to, to have this focus on youth is absolutely fantastic. Uh, in that you do see, as you already saw in the video, you know, very, very deeply engaged youth that want to make want to become part of shaping the society. And it is very clear that the, the development narrative and the development processes need to be more inclusive of all groups and, 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 and youth needs to be absolutely critical, a critical part of that. So so again, I'm, I'm just looking forward to, to hearing the, uh, the, the presentations. I want to thank all the contributors for traveling. If you come to Ottawa and it's minus 10, you must be deeply committed to, to, to our partnership. So thank you very much for, for doing that. I want to thank the uh, colleagues from the UN organizations, as, uh, as were mentioned, our colleagues from Oxfam, of course, uh, recognize the fact that out from Ottawa, some, some colleagues from embassies have, uh, have joined. So very welcome. To, uh, to 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 IDRC, and I'm sure you will uh, you will will uh, will enjoy, will learn a lot from this uh, this presentation. Uh, and finally, also uh, a great welcome to our colleagues from uh, from Global Affairs Canada, and and thank you to uh, to Alexandra or Ali Lamont from uh, uh, from Global Affairs Canada, who will also say a few words of uh, of welcome by way of introduction. Uh, Ali and I we've worked together a lot on, on work on on gender, so it's a great uh, per personally a great pleasure to, uh, to see you here, uh, and Ali has been since, uh, with Global Affairs since uh, 2005, where I believe she started working on trade, uh, on trade issues, uh, and our current job since over the last uh, two years, she has uh, been the Deputy Director of the Economic Growth Policy Unit at the Global Issues and Development Bureau. So, uh, Ali, thank you very much, and we look forward to your, your words as well. Thank you. Very good. Thanks very much, Ariane, for that kind introduction. Um, and uh, merci beaucoup de m'avoir invité. Vous êtes Thanks for having invited me to speak to you this morning. Uh, Ariane described, I'm the Deputy Director for the Economic Growth Policy for Development Unit at Global Affairs Canada. And uh, I manage the team that's responsible for policy and specialist advice in economic growth programming for, uh, for Global Affairs uh, International Assistance Spending. Uh, right now, we're really responsible for the Growth That Works For Everyone action area under the Feminist International Assistance Policy. And my team led the development of managing the input, the consultations, and doing the analysis uh, through the International Assistance Review and then through the development of the FIAP, as we call it, uh, with regards to that, to the economic growth angle. Uh, I'll note that, of course, the, the FIAP does have a number of other significant uh, action areas which are very pertinent to what we're doing today, most notably, I would say, education. There's also a peace and security action area, but I'll be talking er, just about the, the economic growth angle um, uh, for today. Uh, I'm, uh, we are all very aware that there's no sort of further public documents available elaborating the, the uh, FIAP and the action areas yet, but I can see, speak to what our approach is going to look like. Um, I think I'll also, I mean, it's certainly worth mentioning with the Feminist International Assistance Policy, youth really should be seen as synonymous with girls. I think, uh, and that will be reflected in our programming. Our programming will not entirely focus on girls, but it will, of course, have a, a natural emphasis uh, in that direction. Um, very briefly, the approach that we've taken to uh, elaborating the growth that works for everyone action area, um, you know, which which encompasses all the economic growth references and, and pertinent material in the in the fin feminist international assistance policy. Um, we ended up looking at current research, particularly that of the World Bank and of the ODI CPAN, uh, with regards to and, and looked and have taken particularly from their emphasis on not only how to get out of poverty, but how to stay out of it, how to prevent falling back into it. So uh, based on that research, on the feedback from the consultations, we ended up, uh, we've come up with three sort of main approaches to uh, growth that works for everyone. The first one is bringing down barriers to women's economic empowerment. 
Uh, this will have a focus on advancing women's economic rights and leadership, particularly in legal, regulatory, and policy environments. The second is building more inclusive economies. This is really more the traditional uh, or classical economic growth approach, shall we say, strengthening the features of well-functioning market economies, uh, you know, emphasizing entrepreneurship, trade, access to capital, work with the private sector. And the third one is the new one, and, and maybe the most interesting one, and the one we're going to need to probably do the most work in elaborating, and that's strengthening economic resilience uh, by helping the poorest and most vulnerable, and particularly women, uh, escape from poverty by meeting their basic material needs and um, on building their economic resilience. And this is expected to have a focus on financial inclusion, for instance, and the use of social safety nets. So what is the, the relation to youth, uh, peace, and security? Um, we know that 40% of our programming is going to take place in fragile and conflict-affected states um, or environments. Uh, we know that FIAP has, does have an emphasis on youth, mainly, mainly in, in the form of described as girls, but but as youth. So I think the interest to us in this discussion today is really, you know, what is the role of economic inclusion in the economic inclusion of youth in uh, in building and sustaining peace and also in preventing violence and conflict. So um, I will be listening, and I think I have another a member of my team here today, and participating with a view to informing global affairs uh, approach to programming economic growth uh, in this in this regard. How can youth be systemically included in the economy? How can their youth, their economic agency um, and leadership be, be emphasized and, and assisted uh, through our programming? I think that's about it. So thank you very much again, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Hi, I'm just going to, um, I don't want to keep getting up and down, so I'm, I'm actually going to settle in here now, um, uh, like I'm Jimmy Kimball, and um, go into talk show mode, um, and uh, I'd like to uh, thank Ali very much for those remarks. I think it's, it's, it's a huge challenge, um, the issue of youth uh, employment, uh, financial inclusion for boys and girls um, in the global north and in the global south. I mean, these are not just developing country issues that we're talking about. And I think that's one of the really um, uh, innovative things about the report that we're going to hear about. And I think that's a little bit about what we want to uh, unpack here today is, you know, how does this agenda speak to youth, girls, boys, men, women, uh, young youth? Yeah, all, all youth are young, but young people um, in the global north and in the global south. So I would like to um, now pass the floor to uh, uh, Cecile Maserati, who is the head of the UN Secretariat for the Progress Study on Youth, Peace and Security, and who um, calls the UN Population Fund her home. Uh, she is going to give you a little bit of an overview of um, some of the process and uh, some of the framing of this report. And then we will uh, also hear from uh, Dr. Graham Simpson, who is the lead author of the UN Progress Study on Youth, Peace and Security. So um, over to you, Cecile. Much. Can you hear me well? Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much uh, to IRTC for organizing this uh, day today. I'd like to especially uh, thank uh, uh, Global Affairs uh, for their support uh, for the study. Here, as Colleen said, I was in charge of the secretariat that was put in place by the UN, by the United Nations Population Fund and the Peace Building Support Office to support the development of the progress study. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on the, on the study and how we got to, uh, to um, develop the study. It, of course, all started in 2015 with the adoption of Security Council Resolution 2250, um, which, as I believe you all know, was the very first resolution that was entirely dedicated to the positive role um, of young people in the maintenance of international peace and security. What's really interesting is that in 70, almost 70 years of existence, the Security Council had actually said very little about young people before, even though young people are often the majority of the population in countries that are on the agenda of the Security Council. And so throughout decades, the Security Council had either um, barely mentioned young people or mentioned them as a problem 
particularly um, uh, in relationship to their former combatants and the need to reintegrate them, or young people from civil society were mentioned uh, as part of a long list of civil society actors who should be engaged, women, faith-based leaders, young people, etc. So 2250 really marked a shift because it was the very first time an entire resolution was dedicated to discussing why are young people important for peace and security, how they are positive um, influencers um, in, um, uh, in their vast majority, very much following the spirit of the um, resolution 1325 on women, peace and security, um, and um, uh, with a, a similar spirit of inclusion um, and the necessity to uh, ensure peace processes are inclusive of um, uh, various segments of the population. So 2250 was, was adopted under the leadership of Jordan, the country that was in the, in the Security Council at that time. It included a paragraph that mandated the Secretary General of the UN to develop a progress study to document young people's positive contribution to peace. So that's, you can see on the screen, that's an image um, showing the actual adoption of the resolution um, in December 2015. Um, so the, the resolution <laughs> mandated um, the Secretary General of the UN to develop a progress study and what was decided at that time by, um, by the Secretary General and the United Nations is that this study should be independent so that we could provide to member states um, and to, um, uh, to the world uh, unbiased evidence of how young people contribute to peace. So um, Graham uh, was appointed as the lead author. Um, if you please go to the next slide, um, actually another one, and the next, yeah, perfect. The one just after, yes, so that's, um, uh, you'll see here the advisory group that was appointed um, to work with Graham um, on the development of the study. But, so there are here 21 advisors, they're all um, independent, and in a way that I have to say is very untypical of these types of advisory groups for the United Nations, half of them are young people and half of them are women. Um, and uh, we had to really make a case for um, the fact that for such a study, we needed young people engaged in the making at all levels, and that we were looking at a different definition of expertise, and that these young people, even though they didn't have the long prestigious resume that are typically uh, um, the, the uh, specialty of the ministers and high-level senior officials who are appointed in such advisory group, that they had a different type of expertise and experience that they were bringing to the process. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, the steering committee that was put in place. So it's really the network of partners who were engaged um, in providing overall guidance and direction for the study. You'll see many different parts of the United Nations here, um, including uh, UNDP, UNHCR, UNESCO, UNICEF, you and women and many others, but also a lot of civil society partners. Um, and I really want to highlight how originally Resolution 2250 came from civil society and came from young people. Um, and in particular through a, a network of youth-led peacebuilding organizations called You Know Why, the United Network of Young Peace Builders, um, who lobbied international civil society organizations, the UN member states, telling us we do need a resolution that would give us the space that 1325 has created for women, where we can go see our governments and say, you have to listen to us. And it's not just us saying, it's actually the Security Council. So this is really an agenda that's been entirely um, built from the ground up by civil society, working in partnership with a number of actors. And so uh, many of them were engaged um, in this steering committee. And so last but not least on the UN, side, we had a joint secretariat, um, um, uh, as I said, put together by UNFP and PBSO um, to support uh, the, uh, the overall process. So I'm going to stop here, let Graham go on and maybe come back after. Sure. Um, thank you to IDRC. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here and Oxfam and the co-organizer of this event. Um, in some senses, it feels to me like a report back because Global Affairs Canada, of course, was uh, a key supporter of this progress study. And I think it was um, largely on the basis of the support that we received that we were able to pursue some of the issues that Cecile has talked about to ensure that the study was independent, to ensure that it could access young people 
Um, and I have to say, I think in, at, the, at the front end of it, as we began the consultations with young people and throughout the process, um, I made uh, a regular and somewhat rash promise uh, that if young people couldn't see themselves and hear their voices in the presentation of this study to the Security Council and to the General Assembly, then we had failed. Um, in some senses, at the heart of Resolution 2250 was um, an acknowledgement by member states of the UN, by the multilateral system, that 1.8 billion young people, a quarter of the globe's population, um, at least a quarter of whom were living in situations where they were continuously exposed to violence or in situations of ongoing conflict, were essentially voiceless, were excluded and marginalized um, by the world's politics, and that this had produced a growing experience, and this became very clear in the study, a, a growing sense of mistrust by young people um, and a growing chasm between them and their governments and the multilateral system and even international civil society organizations. So from the very outset, it was clear that if we were going to try and address the problem of exclusion and marginalization as a core concern of the study, we couldn't afford to reproduce that exclusion in our methods. We had to make this a participatory and as inclusive a process as possible. And in some ways, this was not the traditional way in which these sorts of reports were done within the UN system. So there was, because of the dedication of those inside the system to this and to making the shift, um, a real commitment to trying to make this as inclusive and participatory as possible. Our initial concerns were it won't be enough to just do the regional consultations that the UN often does, um, in which we are comfortable with the fact that the young people who are in the room have the necessary language skills, have the passports, can travel, are often the usual interlocutors with UN agencies and familiar with the UN policy space, but that we had to reach young people who would not normally have a voice in these sorts of processes. We had to extend beyond that. Uh, we talked about young people who are hard to reach. And I have to say, as soon as we spoke to those young people and listened to them, they were very quick to tell us, we aren't hard to reach. You're just not very good at listening to us. <laughs> and so we changed our language. We talked about young people who wouldn't normally have a voice in these policy processes and shifted it from young people who are hard to reach. Um, the other thing is that I think what we did is under the radar in a, in a way that I think is really imp important and innovative for the UN, which is an organization of member states, is sometimes quite clumsy in its dealing with civil society and it's navigating those roles. We're very good at understanding the impact of non-state actors as progenitors of violence and conflict, but we're not as good at working with non-state actors as the solvers and, the, and, and the, 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 the partners in that exercise, despite good intentions in doing that. And I think one of the things that became very clear in the study was that it was civil society organizations who had trust-based access to young people on the ground in countries because they worked with them, because they listened to them, because there was a legacy of that, that could provide a different level of access for the study. And so a collaboration of civil society organizations reflected in the steering committee welcomed into a partnership with the UN, I think was an extraordinary achievement in the study and we shouldn't underestimate it um, uh, because what it did is it enabled us to run 280 focus groups in 44 countries with indigenous women in Guatemala and combatants in the Philippines and second generation migrant youth in the neighborhoods of, of Stockholm and young African American youth in Chicago and New York. And it was through the voluntary contributions and the support provided to civil society organizations through the UN's willingness to do this that I think we created a completely different access. Uh, 35 thematic and country studies submitted to us on this, in addition to the regional consultations. The United Network of Young Peacebuilders and Search for Common Ground partnered in running a survey of youth-led peacebuilding organizations in which more than 400 youth-led peacebuilding organizations responded. So I do want to emphasize this because I think the way this was done and the, uh, the methodology of the study, this is not a boring question of academic methodology. This is about a a demonstration effect of participation and inclusion of young people in the process itself. The second issue is that we were very mindful of not reinventing the policy wheel. 
Um, and it was extraordinary to see the way in which young people themselves articulated very clearly the way in which the youth peace and security agenda became a critical tool for operationalizing the core missions and the core objectives of the UN and indeed bridging the silos that often exist between peace building, development, human rights as the pillars of UN operation as well as humanitarian action etc. But what became very clear very quickly from young people's voice themselves was that the woman peace and security agenda and the youth peace and security agenda were joined at the hip. They were intricately in, in, connected to each other. We got extraordinary advice on what to do and what not to do from the lessons of the woman peace and security exercise. But much more importantly, it was the assertion of the fact that this was about the distinct experience of young women and the gendered discourse around this. And as well as that, the strong emphasis on the need to address masculinity and to find ways of crafting alternative forms of masculinity that were not dependent on control of or access to young women. So the gender discourse really connected women, peace and security and youth, peace and security. It was absolutely clear that the engagement in young people and the engagement with young people was critical to a prevention agenda and so was at the heart of the sustaining peace agenda within the UN. And it was absolutely evident that young people were crying out for protection and for a human rights framework within which to protect not just their physical well-being, but the space in which they could operate, the arenas in which they could contribute to peaceful, uh, to, to peaceful societies. Um, so from a human rights perspective, from the perspective of sustaining peace, and from the perspective of women, peace and security agenda, the policy discourse here was one which embedded youth, peace and security within those frameworks. Young people helped us to do this in relation to the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs by saying, don't ghettoize us. You don't find young people only in youth organizations. We are in women's organizations. We are in human rights organizations. We are in the policing institutions and in the communities being policed. And on the development discourse, they said, we are not just part of a select number of the SDGs that are seen as relevant to young people. Every SDG is a youth SDG. And so they saw themselves and articulated very clearly that they were at the heart of the, of the of Agenda 2030. I suppose at the front end of the study, what became very clear was that young people, despite that vision of themselves, despite that positioning of themselves, despite that clear articulation of how central they are to all of our agendas, they also said that they, the, the mistrust is reciprocated, that they don't feel trusted. And worse than that, young people were very clear in articulating how predominant stereotypes, themselves very gendered, when conversing about youth, peace and security, the prevailing image of, uh, of young people is a young man with a gun and a young woman consigned to the passive status of victimhood. And in both those respects, young people said these stereotypes deprive us of our sense of leadership, agency, belonging, and our contributions to peace. And so this stereotype, these stereotypes were at the center of what we heard from young people. We also saw very clearly in the study strong evidence that this has given rise to policy myths and assumptions that have largely misshapen the way in which the international community has invested in youth. Um, that these policy myths were embedded in three core areas. Firstly, assumptions that growing youth populations as a proportion of the population as a whole, so-called youth bulges, present an, a necessary threat of increased levels of conflict and violence. Secondly, an association with, with migration that young people represent a threat, an, in, uh, an intrusion, uh, uh, an infiltration of terrorists, people who steal our jobs, criminals, that young people were negatively associated with violence through the migration conversations. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the assumption that all young people were at risk of being recruited into extremist armed groups. Well, the evidence showed that most of these assumptions are flawed and based on very little evidence, and there's very strong evidence to counteract them. At its heart, it's a recognition of the fact that it is only a tiny sliver of young people who find their ways into these violent underworlds. 
and that it's the vast majority of young people who are not all, let's be frank, peace builders. We can't romanticize young people any more than we can afford to demonize them. Um, but that young people were, uh, are very actively involved as contributors to peace. And the extraordinary thing about the mandate of the study was that it was a mandate to explore this contribution, the positive contribution of young people, the opportunity to open up that space where the majority of young people are. Instead of the skewed investment in hard security-based approaches which treat young people as a threat and young people as a problem. And I think this is at the heart of the study. So there are really two key findings um, that, that I want to profile for you and a series of recommendations that follow those. The first is that young people said the problem is a problem of exclusion. And until we address the problem of young people's exclusion, we will never prevent the, the, the issues of youth uh, extremism. That until we address exclusion, we can't deal with extremism. And so the focus and the priority has been on understanding what young people mean by meaningful participation and meaningful ex inclusion. Recognizing that this is both about politics and not just formal politics in the electoral space. It was fascinating when, you, when, when young people talked about where they intersect with their states, where they meet their governments. They often talked about criminal justice or they talked about education. And they said, we are the primary objects of some of these uh, state institutions, and yet we have no say in uh, criminal justice reform. We have no say in the design and uh, curriculum of our educational institutions. So political participation was in all those arenas of young people's lives. The mistrust that young people expressed was not just in political systems, it was also in economic systems of inequality from which they felt excluded. And they were very emphatic about saying, yes, jobs are very important to us, but jobs are important to us because they provide us with a stake and a sense of meaning and belonging in society. They're not important for us because we're just economic automatons. They said we need to go beyond just jobs. We need to recognize this as being a stake in unequal um, economies, in the development strategies of our societies. Of course, young people talked about exclusion by reference to human rights, and I've talked about this, but they were emphatic that this is about protecting the space, the, the, the rights of peaceful protest and dissent as a contribution to change and to building peace rather than as a threat and violence. They talked about gender and the gender discourse as central to this. And gender th is a theme throughout all of these, so that in educational uh, contexts, in the political experience, in reintegration and, and uh, demobilization and reintegration of young people who are former combat, in all these arenas, there was the distinct and particular experience of young women and a gender discourse around that and these issues of masculinity. So in all these areas, young people talked about the violence of exclusion the systemic patterns of exclusion across all of these arenas. And we need to recognize that. So the first core message and set of recommendations of the study are essentially a series of recommendations about what inclusion needs to look like, how to address this issue of exclusion. And I won't go into the recommendations in detail. You can read them, but that's one. The second the second set of recommendations revolved around the alternative space, because what we were recognizing in this, in the study of young people's positive contribution to peace, was the extraordinary creativity, resilience, resourcefulness, innovation of young people's youth-led and youth-based peace building. And frankly, they, they have so much to teach us. Young people are working across the across the spectrum of, of, of phases of, of building peace, from early intervention models, working with younger children, oriented around prevention of the early outbreak through escalation, continuation, right through to uh, national processes associated with formal peace processes, the prevention of recurrence, and the recognition of the transmutation of violence. Young people are working on peace building across all these phases of conflict. They're working from the most local level at intimate levels, family, people-to-people -people peace building, work in communities, through to global coalitions that drove Resolution 2250. 
they recognize and are working across different typologies of conflict and violence. Young people are talking about gender-based violence, female genital mutilation, political violence, terrorist violence, the phenomenon of criminality. Young uh, participants in this Caribbean and Central American consultation were very quick to say, if you talk only about countering violent extremism, you will be talking about a geopolitics of particular regions of the world that completely denies our experience in Central America around gangs, around the phenomenon phenomenon of, of gender-based violence, etc., etc. Young people were demonstrating in their methodologies innovative and creative tools, whether it was sports, culture, the utilization of popular mechanisms for this, and perhaps most importantly, the occupation of cyberspace as alternative places for direct political engagement, new forms of connectivity, innovative ways of participating in political spaces. And finally, young people were very assertive of defending the space for their freedom of assembly and protest and peaceful dissent as critical to building peace and to driving change in society. And so the second set of recommendations of the study are all about how do we feed this innovative space? How do we expand this? How do we make sure that instead of investing massive resources in hard security measures that treat young, this tiny sliver of young people as a threat, we instead invest in the innovative, creative space of youth-led peace building, of the resilience and innovation of young people. And so in conclusion, I think that the study recognized that we need to talk about young people as a demographic dividend, but that it doesn't help to do this just because young people are large in numbers. Um, that what we need to do and what the study promotes is the idea that we need to move from uh, from a demographic dividend to recognizing this as a peace dividend, that the investment in young people is about a contribution to peace, not just because of their numbers, but because of their innovation, their creativity, their resourcefulness. And that this is a unique alternative opportunity for the international community and for international actors. But it demands some seismic shifts. It demands that we move from an essentially remedial approach to young people as a problem to a prevention-based approach, which sees young people as a source of investment. We need to inv move from investing in risk to investing in resilience. And in particular, we need to invest in the unique and extraordinary partnerships that young people forge across all these sectors. The transformative value of youth-led peace building is that it traverses all of these areas of young people's lives that can't be segmented and siloed. And so the third set of recommendations is about how the international community needs to invest in those partnerships, in those capacities, in those resources, to make sure that young people have a, a place at the center of UN action, within member states, at the domestic level, etc. And so I'll leave it there. The, these sets of recommendations, which you will read, I'm sure, in great detail, are about investing in young people, about inclusion, and about investing in partnership to achieve that. So, one last comment on this, yes. right, if that's okay. okay so yeah. Thank you, always Sorry. a hard uh, act to follow Graham. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to talk a little bit about the next steps because the, so the study was um, presented to the Security Council in April of last year. Um, in its short version, um, it, I just want to highlight that uh, next to Graham on that day in the Security Council chamber, three young women briefed the Council, which also was a first in the history of the Council. We had the UN Youth Envoy um, and two young women from civil society uh, who were all absolutely brilliant in talking to the Council about young people's leadership and agency um, in terms of peace building and really demonstrating young women uh, taking the lead. We then presented the full version of the study uh, during the General Assembly in September in New York. And you can find these two versions as well as an interactive version on uh, the UNFPA website. Um, if you go um, to unfpa.org slash youth, peace and security, uh, you can also find all of the background and all the research that was carried out for the progress study, all the reports from the consultations, focus group discussions, etc., um, which are, uh, I think, in and by themselves, inc incredibly insightful. So just now a few points about where are we going with this agenda and what the U 
UN has done and is doing since that. The first thing I want to highlight is that there was a new resolution on youth peace and security that was adopted in June last year, Resolution 2419. It was adopted in the weeks that followed the presentation of the study to the Council under the leadership of Peru and Sweden. Uh, what's important with this resolution, so first, um, a second resolution is the, a way to maintain the political momentum and attention on the agenda. This resolution also specifically referenced the sustaining peace agenda, uh, which, had, um, which had been coined after resolution 2250. Um, and so it was a way to really push the youth peace and security agenda <laughs> towards the sustaining peace discussions. We are still trying to keep it away from uh, the discussions around violent extremism and counterterrorism. Uh, if you've looked at Resolution 2250, you will have seen that there's a lot of language there around violent extremism and counterterrorism. It's a bit of a schizophrenic resolution in a way. So really continuing to hammer the message that this is an agenda about peace and about young people as peaceful and not an agenda about young people as uh, would be terrorists. That resolution, um, 2419, also mandated the Secretary General of the UN to report to the Council on the implementation of the resolutions by May 2020. That um, can seem like a bureaucratic exercise, but it actually is a very important accountability mechanism because that is the way for the UN, for member states, to hold themselves accountable on the implementation of the resolution and to maintain this agenda on, um, on the Council. I also want to highlight that the President of the General Assembly um, uh, said when she took her, um, uh, her um, office in September last year that youth peace and security was one of her priorities. It is of course very important because we've um, really tried in the study to demonstrate how youth peace and security is not just about peace and security. It is also very much about countries seen as peaceful countries. We had a consultation uh, in Canada uh, with UNA um, and uh, Adil and colleagues uh, when we were doing the study we had consultations in Europe so really uh, uh, trying to cast this agenda as a global agenda. Um, the UN also for the very first time adopted a youth strategy. It was also launched during the General Assembly in September. It's the, also the first time in the history of the UN that there's a youth strategy. It has five priorities. The fifth one is peace and resilience building. So it is very much about youth peace and security, which for us is a great um, achievement in a way because it really means youth peace and security is now at the heart of the priorities of the United Nations around young people. Um, and uh, we're now in the process of developing a system-wide action plan for the United Nations on youth peace and security with a lot of um, uh, work ongoing um, to support implementation at local and regional levels, support to youth groups, support to national coalitions, support to national level roadmaps, etc. Um, and I also want to uh, finally flag that, again, as 2250 was born out of this partnership with civil society, everything that we do is in partnership with civil society, primarily through the Global Coalition on Youth Peace and Security, which is the interagency platform uh, that was created in 2012 uh, that includes uh, civil society, youth-led groups, foundations, and the UN to really push forward uh, the implementation of 2250. So I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much, um, both uh, Graham and, and Cecile, for giving that, that very uh, comprehensive overview. Um, I think this is, um, as Ariane also signaled in his opening remarks, this is a very different kind of report. And um, I often find that with sort of these very high level policy agendas of United Nations, Security Council, I mean, for people who run in those circles, and many of us do, um, we're very seized with them and they matter. But I think sometimes it's very difficult to, you know, how do you bring them down to earth? And what do these actually really mean? day people living in countries all over the world. And um, I mean, I think uh, some of the things that I took away that, I, that I've heard in the remarks so far is I really appreciate the intersection between this agenda and the women, peace and security agenda, because that has been such a powerful agenda for trying to propel change across the world. So the extent to which we can strengthen and build a partnership between those two agendas, I think, is critically important. 
But in terms of what does this agenda really mean and why is it exciting, I mean, I really see this agenda, it's a real launching pad for activists. And um, I, every time I turn on my social media, I'm always just waiting with bated breath to hear what Greta from Stockholm is going to do next when she talks about climate change. And I think this is a real example of how we can kind of feel the tide shifting and youth voices really raising up and starting to actually put down the marker and put down opinions on the things that really matter in their lives and the kind of change that they want to see and they want to be part of the change. So I think that's a really positive and important message. I think the other piece for us at an organization like RDRC, we're fascinated with the evidence agenda. I mean, there's lots of things in here for researchers to do, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that today and from some of the people who are gathered on the stage here, and we're going to be hearing about it a little bit more uh, during the day. Um, and it's also, it's, it's, a, it's an agenda for policymakers. It's, it's a challenge for policymakers. I really appreciate it also the reference to the youth bulge, the youth menace, um, you know, youth seeing, being seen as a threat, when the evidence actually tells us that youth, the vast majority of youth all over the world are doing very positive things for their societies. So how do we harness that kind of energy? So that's an excellent segue to the next part of our presentation this morning, um, in which we've actually invited um, four speakers here uh, to come here and to talk to you um, about uh, their reactions to this report, why this report matters to them, and how they actually contextualize the findings from this report and what they take away from it. And, um, and how they think that they can actually use this agenda and how it's making a difference in the type of work they're doing. So I first want to um, inv invite some reactions and remarks um, from Carl Clockers. Uh, Carl is the team leader of crime prevention and research with Public Safety Canada, and he's going to um, give us a little bit more framing and uh, remarks around the relevance and the importance of the youth peace and security agenda for Canada. Carl, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, for those who are expecting Lucy in attendance, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but she was uh, unable to get here back in time. I did my best to charter a plane on short notice, but obviously was uh, unsuccessful. But I'm happy to present on behalf of Public Safety Canada and on behalf of Lucy uh, our reactions to this report. Uh, just quickly, you can't uh, go anywhere in the city without checking your mandates. So just to remind people, Public Safety has a mandate to protect Canadian safe from a range of risks related to natural disasters, crime and terrorism, and that we are doing this by building strong and resilient communities. My work is engaged with the National Crime Prevention Strategy in Canada, which is the policy framework we use to invest in at-risk communities involving at-risk youth or vulnerable populations. Um, helping them discover their challenges, identify opportunities, and really invest in those youth uh, before a trajectory uh, comes way. So, it's hard to ignore some of the headlines in Canada. Um, there is a focus on risk and there is you know, a reminder that gen Canada generally is a very safe place, but over the past five years we've seen a relative increase in gun and gang violence. Um, you know, these headlines, they're always at the forefront of the news. And our government has announced the initiative to take action against gun and gang violence recently, but there was a recognition that that strategy would be incomplete if we did not hear from those communities and those voices most adversely affected by gun and gang violence in Canada. And that these members from the communities want to be part of the solution. They are engaged. They are, it, it is imperative for us to rethink and address safety and security from the perspective of those people, to include their voices and to seek out these communities, whether big or small, remote, isolated, urban, rural, it doesn't matter. Get out there and get listening. But the YPS allows Public Safety Canada and the government of Can or sorry, Public Safety Canada and the government at large to think about new ways of involving youth on issues related to rising violence. 
So in 2018, uh, Minister Goodale uh, commissioned a summit on gun and gang violence, and we heard a, a, an overwhelming consensus about a holistic need to uh, address prevention, gang exit enforcement initiatives, and that this really requires distinct solutions because not every challenge is created equal. Um, there was a focus on three key, key elements, the first one being youth participation and engagement, that they need to be part of the planning as well as the presentation of prevention programs and strategies and that there is a need to increase capacity information and tools not only related to law enforcement and border security but also in those youth themselves and third that there is a need for more research so that we can uh, gain better information engage in information sharing practices on gun violence so that we can more accurately address these issues in rural and urban communities. And these are common sense measures based on two things. One is a growing body of knowledge of what works in crime prevention and the local community needs. In regards to gun and gang violence, evidence suggests that strategic investments in neighborhoods and community-based policing will play a critical part in the solution and that it's locally based and comprehensive approaches uh, can help reduce its impact on Canadian communities. So moving away from the bad stories of risk that we often hear about, we're moving, we need to focus on resilience as this as this report uh, illustrates, and that there are five main pillars of action, which we really found uh, spoke well to the NCPS and its overall overarching goals uh, and designs, and that there is a particular focus on the exclusion and marginalization. So they have been continually, continually associated with violence and for youth in particular, but that Resolution 2250 reminds us of this opportunity to build on and increase strengths with the goal to increase resilience and that we can do this, it's critical for us to have measures that related to empowerment, tackling those structural inequalities that may uh, lead youth or other vulnerable populations to engage. Even though it is a small number, there is a high impact to this, but we have to address the lack of opportunities for youth that may exist. Um, 2250 also recognizes, and we at the Government of Canada know that the young people play an important and positive role in the maintenance and promotion of peace and security, and we have to enable them to participate in peace process and dispute resolution. Um, but what I would do is I would go one step further and say that they can be engaged at the forefront. They don't also just have to be engaged at the policy and practice elements, but also there is important and meaningful participation to be held at research and evaluation. So if we're getting on the ground research, which we fund through the NCPS, uh, through our demonstration projects, that you should play a part. External evaluators um, will only capture one perspective, that there is a need to engage in participatory participatory action research, uh, and to include voices from, from those communities. Um, so like I said, the, these opportunities exist to provide youth a sense of ownership and leadership and agency. And this can happen at research, evaluation, policy, and practice. So we need to be uh, cognizant of that going forward when we, when we engage in new funding opportunities under the NCPS. So we are moving this, this conversation now from research to researcher. So these participatory centered methods traditionally used to view it as a problem, which this resolution recognizes, but that PCM or participatory cent centered methods uh, allow us the opportunity to become equal partners in a collaborative policy agenda. And this might be something as simple as addressing the questions that they want addressed or it could be something as uh, simple as carrying out survey design or doing the analysis themselves, but that it de democratizes knowledge, how it's collected, how it's used, and it encourages self-determination and agency at this time. Uh, so just another about that, about uh, youth participatory evaluation, that we are, they're actually engage, evaluating the programs, organizations, and systems designed to serve them. So it's flipping that, flipping that conversation. And while it is labor intensive, the high impacts are, are noted. I mean, it can't go without, oh, I think I hit something. But it can't go without saying that uh, 
that they can have the ability to de develop critical thinking, knowledge, research methods, creativity, generating new insights, and that this information has an emancipatory function uh, to it. All right, I think we're back. Let's see, I'm sorry about that. It might have been my thumb, anyway. Um, all right, thank you very much. Uh, so some of the discussion questions that come out of th this report uh, that we're focusing on going forward are what are the conditions that enable and promote youth engagement and participation in crime prevention activities here in Canada? How can we effectively engage youth that are already on the ground? Is it too late? We, it's never too late to engage these youth, but that we there's still an opportunity to address violence in those communities by uh, talking to those communities. So when we're talking about our strategy in relation to countering radicalization of violence, that we incorporate these voices, we get the word out, we want to hear from them. And third, how can, health, how can youth help advance the overall Government of Canada efforts in violence reduction and community safety and well-being? As we're moving from crime prevention, we are moving away from that risk intervention, critical mass, uh, into a more holistic uh, point of view re regarding their overall well-being, addressing the social inequalities or structural uh, limitations that may exist for a number of youth in Canada. Um, so I just wanted to pin, uh, highlight one in particular thing that we've recently developed is our crime prevention inventory. It currently has about 193 programs uh, that operate on the ground in Canada that focus on at-risk groups or issues related uh, to social economic disadvantages, community support, <coughs> increasing skills, um, and that's available through Public Safety Canada's website. Um, so I encourage you all to, to look at that. There are some locally made uh, strategies that can uh, uh, help policymakers, decision makers, practitioners, and the public at large. And that's good. On time? Excellent. Okay. Not bad for pinch hitting. Excellent. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got a lot in there, Carl, actually. Right. Thank you. Oh, thanks. thanks so much. And it's, it's really, really fascinating and a really exciting agenda that I think Public Safety Canada is trying to take forward. And, you know, as an aside, I feel so energized when I see a strategy like this sitting on the basis of participatory action research and anybody who puts it on the foundation of Paolo Freire, you know, mm -hmm. scores 100 points yeah. in my book. So yeah. excellent to see that uh, to see that surfacing again. Yep. Um, I would like to now turn to um, Sharmake Abduli, who is a program officer with uh, UN Habitat. Uh, he's come to us all the way from Kenya, so thanks so much for making the trip. Um, I follow Kanak. Uh, so uh, he is actually going to uh, provide some insights uh, around the YPS agenda, um, the importance of it uh, and how it's framed up in southern perspectives of relevance and importance and, and grounding that a little bit in some of the work that UN Habitat is taking forward. So um, over to you, Sharma. Uh, thank you, Colleen, and, and thank you to IDRC for the invitation in Oxfam. I'm super you know, excited to be back home as most of you are dreading the end of winter. It's actually refreshing being in, in Nairobi for the last two years to come back home and then get your cool breeze again. Uh, so um, I'd also like to begin by acknowledging um, Algonquin Nation, whose traditional unceded territory we gather upon today. Uh, so let me begin by with those remarks. So I think Graham and Cecile have done a fantastic job really, you know, summarizing the report and, and Cecile has did a, done a fantastic job in terms of giving you the genesis. Um, so as I begin, I think one thing for me to kind of reflect on in terms of how this uh, mandate or this research uh, has really grounded the work that we do here at UN Habitat and what we've been able to do, uh, it's quite fascinating to see uh, a research like this. And as Cecile has alluded to earlier on, um, the UN has never had a comprehensive strategy on youth. And I think um, maybe Cecile and, and Graham would, would differ, but as one of the pen holders, uh, of one of two in UN agencies who are leading the process of developing this UN youth strategy, we reference the, the YPS report often in terms of really giving us a mandate within the UN. And as bureaucrats, as you know, if there isn't a Security Council resolution, there aren't things that you can reflect back to to really push your mandate. So uh, I think this research has done a, a lot in terms of figuring out and, and coordinating uh, UN agencies. Um, the, the research early on looks at these four components. And, and one thing that I think stuck out with me uh, uh, as the uh, research was ongoing, and UN Habitat contributed to this, and I'll allude to some of the research that we did specifically in Somalia, 
uh, that, that contributed to this work in, in Colombia a little later on. But one thing that I think to be mindful throughout this report was the tangible, uh, tangible mutual beneficial engagement that was created as a result of this report. Um, because oftentimes we have you know, um, policymakers who set norms and standards uh, for global peace building, and those standards are often intended to serve. So this, this, this research was the first time we saw the collaboration of, of policy um, you know, makers and researchers who were not just setting the norm, but actually collaborating and working on the ground with those, with folks who were actually working on this uh, research and working on peace building uh, in many parts of the world. So I was asked to look through the, the sustainable development goals. You know, every country and all the member states are required to report back on SDGs. And one of the things that I wanted to do was do a really practical research on some of the indicators. I mean, there's 230 indicators. There are 169 targets. It's a huge report to kind of go through. But how does this relate to uh, YPS? And, and Graham um, referred to this in his talk. And there were three you know, kind of concluding remarks in terms of partnership, investment, and inclusion. And, and I'll get on to breaking this down a bit more. So it not only intersects with youth, in terms of you know, the, the, the 17 SDGs and indicators are all referenced by youth. And this is something consistent we heard in our research that fed into the YPS research, uh, which was led by, by P Public Safety Canada. But I wanted to frame it around the three, again, concluding remarks around investment, inclusion, and um, partnerships. And if you look at investments, um, you know, here are the SDGs that kind of you know, speak out to the, um, the, the, the need and the intersection between investment and youth and engagement in that. I'll move on to our next slide, which, which talks a bit about inclusion and how you know, young people could be included. And UN Habitat's main mandate within the SDGs is SDG 11. Uh, and SDG 11 focuses on resilient communities, uh, ensuring that communities are safe, sustainable. Um, and I think you know, it, it, when I looked at the indicators, there were several that spoke out to specifically UN Habitat's mandate. But if you look at gender, there's a huge uh, intersect and synergies between gender Education, we heard a little early on about um, the um, public, uh, Global Affairs Canada's uh, you know, work around engaging uh, young women in not only businesses, but also entrepreneurship. And this is quite consistent with the research uh, that was done here. So I'll move on to, to partnerships. Uh, again, this quickly articulates how partnerships are, are a key component um, to the SDGs as well, and the, and the synergies and the linkages between um, SDGs and this progress report. Concretely, so what's UN Habitat doing to implement YPS? As Cecile referred to early on, in 2015, the mandate was given uh, and, and this uh, resolution was taken on um, by, by the Security Council. One of the first countries to implement YPS, and we hear this negative narrative consistently about Somalia, was actually Somalia. So within the UN country programs um, and the uh, youth-led organizations, one of the first things that they did was Two months after the Security Council resolution was signed, is they held this massive uh, event where youth-led organizations, in partnership with the federal government of Somalia, said, "You know, we often hear about young people as part of Al Shabaab, but the vast majority of young people are not participating in conflict. So, how do we change this narrative? How do we engage young people in this uh, global mandate now?" Um, so, what we did is, as, as, as country teams and as a global headquarters, we worked closely with our country team in Somalia to say, "Well," How can we evaluate all the programs we have within Somalia to look at you know, how does it meet the needs of, of YPS? How can we measure progress on, on YPS? And, and this is still a work in progress in terms of measuring. How can we get young people early on in the evaluation, as, as you were talking about? And I think this is where um, you know, Canada's leadership is really around uh, prevention. And, and I don't say this as, as a fellow Canuck, but uh, to be honest, looking at the world of work, and you know, uh, two months ago, Public Safety Canada held their 20th anniversary around prevention. But I think there's some good tools that Canada was able to develop in terms of evaluating uh, the effectiveness and engaging early on in participatory action research, which is a key component of what we're doing in our youth uh, programming in Somalia. Uh, we're also using body mapping, um, as you see there, and in, in some of the work that we've, we're doing in Colombia, and a very tangible project. And one thing that we were able to quickly realize is Young people are not asking for huge investments. They're not looking for two, three hundred thousand dollars in youth programs. They're looking for five, ten thousand dollars. We have something called the, the Urban Youth Fund, uh, where we've piloted a number of different countries, but with the focus specifically in Colombia and Somalia, 
now looking at how do you engage young people. Young people are extremely innovative in entrepreneurship. So instead of the typical job, and we know that there isn't, even in the global north, uh, equivalency of one job available for every youth. So how do we engage them in the entrepreneurship sector? And it was quite phenomenal to see 10 startups in Colombia reintegrating formal FARC fighters uh, who were in the woods, very, uh, sorry, in the, in the forests of Colombia, very little uh, skill, but we partnered with an organization called SENA, which is a vocational training center, to look at specific skills. And then we, we gave them some seed capital uh, to look at starting businesses within their own communities to really um, bring this agenda home. Uh, and we heard loud and clear that they weren't interested, again, in loads of funding. They wanted to figure out how to manage the, the resources that we gave them and look at you know, building the skills as opposed to just a job. Um, so these are two uh, quite you know, neat initiatives that I'd like to highlight the approach that was taken in Somalia specifically. We have a project now where we're incubating about 12 businesses specifically in the construction sector in Somalia. Uh, one of the biggest booms as the country continues to rebuild uh, is the construction sector. And, and young people were able to start 12 businesses within that, looking at you know, sourcing locally sourced construction material, looking at event management or construction management. So it's, it's a comprehensive training that we were doing for about three months. Uh, and as a result, and as a direct outcome, um, here, those are some of the businesses that were able to, to kind of be incubated. And, you know, one of the things kind of looking forward in terms of implementing the YPS uh, agenda, one of the things that, you know, we, we often think about with global agendas is, you know, the real work takes place at a local level, at a city, community level. So we need to think beyond kind of just the tokenization of young people, uh, and, the, and the report really speaks loud and clear to that. We need to think of the, the structures that reinforce exclusion uh, as, as reference. And you know, I think of my experience as a young person here in Canada who is active in, in the community circles, active on campus, and it was often young people who are already engaged uh, and, and going beyond that to look at young people who are active, who are, who are not the traditional people that we're engaging. Uh, and this is some of the work that I was involved in during my time here with Crime Prevention Ottawa, looking at social housing communities, young people who are often excluded uh, from processes uh, such as these. Uh, we need to move away from you know, uh, the simplistic kind of youth bulge argument, as, 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 as Bram kind of alluded to. I think this is super, super important. Uh, we must be looking at you know, empowered questions of existing paradigms uh, that work against young people. You know, the exclusion is bringing conflict came out consistently. Um, we, one of the researches that we uh, published with the World Bank that fed into this global YPS report um, is, is, is a research, and to be honest, it was quite eerie. We, we arrived at the same conclusions that the YPS uh, research, uh, you know, uh, and this was specifically done across three cities in Somalia uh, in partnership with the World Bank, and, and the title of that research, if you're interested, is Youth as Agents of Peace. Uh, Somalia. Uh, and again, young people weren't interested in the, the, the usual narrative that's given, uh, even in a conflict-prone uh, country that is you know, slowly recovering from, uh, from con over 20 years of conflict. So some of the things that I think, uh, questions that we must be critical about, you know, how do we as institutions engage with youth? And, and I'm happy to hear uh, Public Safety Canada is thinking about it. One thing that I often think about uh, a lot is, you know, um, Working with police service organizations, the Ottawa Police Service has a youth advisory council that has been you know, in existence, um, Jess can give me the exact year, for, for a number of years. But one of the things that is you know, really fascinating to me within law enforcement, there's this usual paradigm shift that young people are not naturally um, supposed to be you know, friends with police officers, but there's a great synergy within that. I'll end by saying what you know, a key outcome for me has been you know, this, this, this research fosters a do no harm and leave no one behind, which must inform every step of the way kind of moving forward as policymakers, as people who are working in this field. So thank you. Um, Chair Mackey, uh, that also another really, really interesting and, and, and insightful set of remarks. Um, you know, here in Canada, we the news we receive on things like Somalia is often so one-sided. Um, and, and, and it's difficult and it's disturbing because we also have such a large Somali uh, community here in Canada and, 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 a, and a, a very large sector of Somali youth. So it's, it's quite um, it's energizing and, and positive to see the work, kind of work that uh, UN Habitat is, 
is supporting in countries like Somalia and in Colombia. Um, I'd like to turn now to um, Bernadetta Killian, who is um, an associate professor with the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Uh, Bernadetta uh, works um, in collaboration uh, with what we call in IDRC our youth cohort. Uh, so we have a very large grouping of projects around youth peace and security um, and employment. And so uh, Bernadetta is one of the researchers that's been doing really important work on that uh, in East Africa. And so we will turn to her now to hear a little bit more about her perspectives on the report and, um, and the linkages uh, to the, the work that she is uh, advancing uh, in Tanzania. Over to you, Bernadetta. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DRC, for inviting me. This is my first time here in Canada, uh, and um, I'm enjoying the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start by saying that uh, I think many of you are aware that uh, in Africa, Africa, the only region where uh, the, 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 the youth population is increasing why the rest of the world is aging, and the, uh, the number of youth is going to double uh, by 2050, and uh, about 60% uh, of the population uh, in Africa are under age of 25. So when we speak about Africa, we speak about the youth. And as I was reading the report, uh, I could actually clearly see from the report, I think they did quite a, a wonderful job of capturing the aspirations, the, uh, the, the dreams, and uh, the needs and the demands of the uh, African youth, I could clearly see from, from, from the, the report. What I want to, to, to say today to you is actually there are no shortages of frameworks and instruments uh, about the youth uh, in Africa, especially at the, uh, at the level of the uh, African Union. Um, even before the UN Resolution 2015, Already uh, in Africa, they had adopted a very comprehensive youth, uh, youth charter uh, in 2006, which uh, deals with a lot of many other things, including uh, peace and security in Article 17, which specifically uh, acknowledges and uh, promotes the positive uh, role of, of youth in promoting uh, peace and security. And uh, it urges member states, for example, to strengthen the capacity of young people and youth organizations in peace building, conflict prevention, and conflict resolutions uh, through using different kinds of uh, methods, including uh, intercultural learning, civic education, tolerance, human rights, democracy, mutual respect. Uh, the African uh, Youth Charter also calls uh, member states to institute mechanism to promote a culture of peace and tolerance among the, among the, the young people. However, one thing to note, uh, this, this, this charter covers uh, different aspects of uh, youth empowerment. So uh, uh, it's not like the UND Resolution uh, 2250, uh, which it clearly uh, deals with the promotion of youth peace and security. And that has not yet uh, taken place in the African context. But overall, uh, the theme of youth uh, has become very popular uh, in African Union uh, meetings and conferences. And the UN Resolution 2050 has sparked a great deal of debate about uh, youth uh, uh, role in the development in peace and security within the corridors of African Union. But also, I'll also speak a little bit about uh, uh, East African community and IGAD. So within the African Union, as you can see, they even have a youth division. They have various programs, uh, Youth for Peace, African Youth Day, uh, AU Youth Envoy. Uh, they have even a EU roadmap on harnessing the demographic dividend and investing on the youth. The African Union, uh, Union Agenda 2063 for the coming 50 years actually uh, recognize the, the positive role of youth uh, for development and in peace and, and security. And here there are more, uh, a list of more instruments uh, that actually focus on the uh, question of, of youth. One thing I should bring to your attention uh, is uh, African Youth Fund, whereby uh, African Union has decided to set 1% uh, of its budget 
uh, to cover for uh, youth programs and the, and, the, and, the, and the activities in the continent. So a lot, a lot has been happening with regards to the, to the youth. But let me also mention uh, African Union uh, decision uh, by the uh, Peace and Security Council uh, that was adopted in 2018. Actually, it urges member states to urgently implement uh, the UN uh, 2250 resolution. So in terms of uh, being accepted and recognized, uh, the resolution has received a great deal of uh, positive response at the level of the uh, African Union and many of the, of the African uh, countries. Now, what about the implementation? And that's where the problem is. Uh, despite of the fact that there has been uh, you know, a lot of uh, plans, like a 10 decade, I mean a decade uh, youth strategic plan that is really written, but there hasn't been any uh, serious effort to monitor implementation and evaluate uh, these youth policies that are in place for many, many years. But of course, as you well know, African Union uh, suffers uh, a problem of enforcement of its resolutions and decisions. It's upon the member states to decide whether to implement or not to implement. And what I'm saying here is that despite uh, the fact that there have been a series of meetings, conferences, you know, resolutions regarding our youth, but on the ground, on the reality, uh, I see a disconnect between, uh, you know, positive uh, reception of the resolution at the AU level and the, uh, what's going on on the ground. At the level of the East African uh, context, of course, the East African community also uh, adopted youth policy back in 2003. And the, it covers a lot of other things, but it has a section on uh, youth role on peace and security. Uh, also, uh, EGAC, it has a lot of uh, um, activities uh, to do with the involvement of youth in peace and, 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 and security. But uh, if you go down uh, on the local level, on the ground, based on our own uh, research that we are doing uh, with the other uh, members here in the, in, the, in, the, in the team, it's like uh, the youth are asking this question, whose peace? are we talking about here? Uh, from our study, you can see that, um, I, for example, I asked one of the uh, youth leader of a youth-led organization in Tanzania uh, his opinion about whether his organization has got uh, space to mobilize and organize the youth. And he says yes, uh, despite of the squeezing space uh, that is taking place now in many of the African countries, but in the world, then I ask you, why? Why is it so that you have this uh, ability to, to mobilize? They say, you know what? If, if you focus on issues of peace, the government leaves you alone. So uh, in the other words, uh, this peace that we are talking about, on the part of the rulers, they would like to regulate, to coordinate, and to manipulate uh, the youth activism. And therefore, they will tolerate if they find that this organization is actually dealing with the uh, peace issues in order to, to, to contain the youth activism. But if you read the report uh, here, you, the youth wants more than just the end of conflict, than just the end of violence. Their conception of peace is more thick and more deep, and it covers various aspects of, of life. And uh, I, I was very fascinated by this uh, quotation from the report uh, where young people see peace as deeply political issue related to authorities and the formal governance in which they, are, they have lost trust. So it all goes down to the issue of marginalization, especially political marginalization, the political exclusion. And this issue is very important, especially in Africa, where, whereby uh, the average age of the, of, of the president there is 62. But uh, the, the, the mean age, the total population, is actually 19.2. So there is a high level of generational uh, inequality in between the governors and the governed. And this is where uh, it all comes down. The youth feel marginalized politically. They are not part of the decision-making process. They are excluded. And here I would like to borrow uh, uh, from Ayob, uh, where he's talking about the double ages of youth agency 
in the context of Africa, youth, youth, youth agents can actually play the both role. Youth agents can be used to, for, for, you know, to resist and challenge the status quo, challenge the, the power elites for peace. Uh, we saw what happened, for example, the role of youth in the Gambia, uh, where there was a peaceful transition of power from the you know, dictator regime to, the, to, to democracy, if you like. And the youth played quite a, quite a key role. And then, but the youth agents can also be used to legitimize power. And there are so many examples in the African context whereby uh, the youth find themselves divided for political reasons. They, you know, due to uh, partisan um, uh, consideration, uh, and whereby some of the youth organizations are being used to legitimize power, play peaceful, but not really peaceful. Uh, they are being manipulated through tokenism in the name of peace. So uh, what we are, we, are, we, are, we are finding here, it's very important as we uh, advocate for peace, as we implement the resolution, it's very important to be uh, very uh, recognized of the fact that this uh, agenda of peace can be easily manipulated to maintain the status quo and legitimize uh, the structural inequalities that exist in the society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, um, Bernadetta. That really gives us some insight on, first, just how much is actually going on in, in Africa and how strongly this agenda has been already implanted there. Um, but also really interesting to hear about some of those challenges of actually trying to move from codification to implementation and you know, bringing it actually really right down to a very local level, how it looks different in different places and um, some of the challenges related to that. So I actually just want to turn now to our last respondent, um, who is uh, Adil Scali, who is a program manager with United Nations Association of Canada. And Adil was um, quite uh, active, um, as Cecile mentioned, in um, helping uh, mobilize youth in Canada to input into uh, the YPS agenda. Uh, so he's going to talk to a little bit uh, about that with us and. Uh, provide some insights on um, what the YPS agenda uh, means from his perspective uh, to Canadian youth. Over to you, Adil. Good morning. Thank you. And uh, thank you for having me. Un grand merci aussi au Centre de Recherche. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So my association had a few consultations with the youth, with youth in BC. There was also a conference, a peacekeeping cooperation that was held in Vancouver in 2017 with the support of the Defense Department. We managed to consult our youth and to see what role they can play in Canada in this uh, YPS program. What's quite surprising, uh, there's a lot of common points between Canada and its annual report. Canada is not an exception to the rule. What's quite surprising is that there is a lot of challenges we are facing. Canada is facing the same challenges as other countries. These challenges are universal. This, universal, this universal, universality of this report is quite striking, especially when we talk about the various uh, common points between Canadian youth and youth from other countries. All youth agree that there is too much inclusion. They also say that there's, there are a lot of initiatives and invest, investment in creative spaces so that youth could really um, participate in peace building. So a lot of work going on in Canada. Peace and security from a national level um, really goes, uh, is, is very diverse in the sense where there's a lot of academia and research done on this topic, activism and volunteering from, uh, from, uh, from young people. Um, and peace building doesn't just mean that you have a title uh, that says you are a peace builder or you work in an organization with a mission of peace building. But we see a lot of work done um, through civil society organizations, social enterprise, youth organizations, um, you know, community centers, crisis lines, and so on. And so that's, those are only a few of the areas that Canadian youth are engaged in when it comes to um, peace and security. When asked about 
um, what is the relevance of 2250 or resolution 2250 in Canada, uh, I have to admit that not many young people saw it right away. And they had to read the resolution first and really try to uh, uh, think about um, how it is relevant to them. But uh, quickly, uh, a number of things come, come to light. Um, mainly, uh, and this is not in an order of, of more or least importance, it's just in, in terms of points that were brought up. Mainly, um, street safety and gun violence and gang violence, as, one, as mentioned by uh, one of the panelists, um, that a lot of uh, folks in a lot of urban and rural areas, and especially our indigenous communities, do not feel safe in the streets. Especially, uh, especially vulnerable communities, uh, whether that's um, indigenous communities, uh, women and girls, um, uh, newcomers, immigrants and refugees and so on, that there is a real sense that uh, there is a, a street safety concern there. Um, food security is an essential um, uh, topic that came up uh, over the course of our consultations. Um, the reality of our food security, both in the Northern Territories and, and other provinces, but also in urban areas is quite remarkable. Um, and that is a big source of tension between communities. Um, and uh, we cannot talk uh, about peace if uh, stomachs are not full and, and children are not healthy. Um, upholding freedom of speech and protection from social harm, so readjusting the judicial system, um, improving our education systems, making our education more inclusive and accessible, so reducing barriers to these uh, to education. Um, and this, of course, also includes um, improving our relations with our indigenous peoples through a myriad of different efforts, not just a security issue or, 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 a, or a judicial reform, but really looking at uh, the, the relationships that citizens um, have with one another. Um, so all this to say that um, Canada has considerable efforts to make in each of the five pillars of the resolution. Um, however, our Canadian youth have uh, come up with three main uh, priority pillars, which is participation, uh, protection, and prevention. Um, and so uh, I, one of the things that I wanted to say is that something that came out uh, quite, um, quite often is that um, peace is a deeply political issue. And that I think that we've seen this across, across different communities. So when we talk about participation, protection, and prevention, we're, we're talking about um, meaningful and equitable avenues and opportunities for youth engagement. And the key word there is, me key words are meaningful and equitable. And I'll get to that in a, in shortly. Uh, the second thing is the protection, protecting youth from social harm. So again, especially the marginalized, racialized, and colonized communities uh, around the country. And finally, ensuring, again, equitable economic and social development. So when it comes to participation, um, first of all, um, this notion that youth are the future is something that really annoys young people. Essentially, what folks are saying is that, well, it's not for today, maybe tomorrow, and we will consider what you have to say. Um, the second thing is the, uh, the, the fluid definition of youth and saying, oh, well, we have a young person on the table, check that box. That is not the case, that it is a diverse cohort. Um, it is a fluid term, even in terms of the definitions of uh, the definition of youth, I'm sure that between UN Habitat and the UN Population Fund and ourselves and the Government of Canada, we each have a different definition of what youth, uh, of what youth is. But going back to meaningful opportunities is the lack of meaningful opportunities and also the lack of access or in, uh, equitable access to, to, to those opportunities. So we are relatively um, uh, privileged in Canada to have a lot of youth opportun opportunities for youth, whether in terms of employment or uh, career development or professional and personal development, um, relatively speaking. However, when it comes to uh, the threshold of or who, who gets to participate um, and what are the different conditions needed for those uh, to participate in these opportunities, uh, we see the exclusion of many communities whether that's members of the LGBTQ plus communities, visible minorities, newcomers to, to, to Canada, uh, refugees and new immigrants. Um, so lowering the threshold um, to accepting these folks to, to, uh, to participate in these uh, opportunities is very important. Um, and the issue of, of money comes up, of course. A lot of these extracurricular activities that folks do um, whether that's volunteering or not, is uh, the opportunity cost is a job, is an income. Um, so uh, a lot of opportunities are really given to the, the privilege that one 
can volunteer their time and not get paid for a certain amount of time. Um, two, uh, you know, people still have trouble um, paying for the public transport and getting to these opportunities. So, so it's it's thinking sometimes about the details and thinking about um, who is not in the room and why are they not in the room and how can we make that happen is is what meaningful participation for young people mean. Um, in terms of prevention, um, it's. Uh, Again, it's not an order of importance, but certainly realigning learning outcomes from the education system with 21st century skills. Um, and we have learned through a lot of research and the progress study that employment in and of itself is not, is not what keeps folks away from, um, from violence or from these sorts of conflicts, but it's about meaningful participation, meaningful employment, um, and a sense of agency in that work. Um, so, uh, so, so making sure that there is a transition, that we ensure the transition between uh, post-secondary education and uh, the workforce. Uh, working on our relations with indigenous peoples, um, it is necessary because that will reactivate, to accelerate rather the process of, um, of uh, decolonization, of, of reconciliation, of you know, building those relationships and preventing future rifts. And finally, at the international scale, which was very interesting because uh, this is the one of the only international points that they that, that our folks brought up was um, really uh, thinking about Canada's role in development, um, and we do welcome uh, Canada's feminist international assistance policy, but it's really looking also at Canada's role in resources extraction in a lot of other international countries, mainly Africa, um, and how that could lead to larger security risks both at home and abroad, and especially in terms of our relations with indigenous peoples. Finally, um, it's protection. So uh, it's protection from social harm. So individuals from communities of the uh, LGBTQ plus communities or uh, indigenous communities, immigra uh, immigrants and refugees, we see a high suicide rate, we see high mental health issues, the judicial system is not set up in their favor. Um, it is not protecting them. And, and our report that, that came out of the consultation, we outline a number of recommendations about how to, to uh, realign the, the judicial system to, to help folks that are vulnerable to, the, to that. Um, greater investment in uh, community groups, community centers, and shelters. They are the ones that are on the ground. Is lo investing locally is very important. Uh, work with the police services have been mentioned, and that cannot be stressed enough. Um, and it's really investing in, uh, locally. Um, addressing the issue of unsafe streets and, and uh, making it very clear that it is um, specifically for vulnerable groups and mainly uh, women, uh, uh, women and women of color um, that feel unsafe in the streets. Um, and finally, is greater investments and better, um, a better management of mental health, drug abuse, domestic violence, sexualization of women, cyberbullying, and xenophobia. And that is all for um, unity, integration, uh, dispelling biases um, and, and prejudice, and of course, rebuilding of trust um, across, uh, across communities. So um, in terms of next steps, we're very much looking forward to what the UN is going to, uh, how the, the UN youth strategy is going to look like exactly. Um, the Prime Minister's Office and the Government of Canada have been very receptive to our reports um, and, and to the different consultations they've been doing. Namely, there is a national youth policy coming up, hopefully in the next few, uh, few months, and we'll see how that looks like. Um, and we are looking into uh, increased investments in local communities and civil society organizations to, uh, um, to, to, to build those gaps, uh, to, to merge those gaps and, and build those communities stronger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you for all our. Uh, thank you to all our panelists. That's a quite. It was a quite an interesting conversation. Now this will be the Q and A session. You can ask your questions. You can raise your comments. Actions that um, anyone here would like to make uh, to um, any of our panelists here, to Graham or Cecile, or to uh, any of our comment, um, commenterists who have offered um, very interesting insights from different perspectives around the relevance and the significance of the YPS report, um, both in the Global South and uh, in the North and in here in Canada. So uh, the floor is open to you. We have two mics, one here and uh, one here. Uh, so I would 
uh, invite you to uh, uh, to come up to the mic. So let's uh, start over. Hey, good here. morning. My name is Houston, uh, Center for Peace and Development, University of Juba, South Sudan. Uh, my first question to Graham and uh, maybe the rest can jack in. The resolution 2419-2250, what are they different from the other Security Council resolutions to the member states? Um, and then I have uh, two comments to the other members too, especially to my sister from Africa, Kariboni. Um, a lot of youth in Africa, Egypt tends to look across Libya, Tunisia, Al Algeria, Congo, Uganda, Central Africa, South Sudan, Sudan. They are the one actually affect change in demonstrations to change the government, the regimes. But how many of them do you see them a cabinet minister? That's a reality. And now we talked about the issue of, uh, of the age. How do you define the youth? In Africa, I was in Addis 2014 and 15 for the peace talk between the government of Sudan and the opposition. And the minister of the youth was 55. She was 55. And then she talks about the issue of the youth and the deputy or, or the deputy uh, president talk about the issue of the youth, but there's no youth there. And I have seen in this uh, video, uh, Malwal Bolkir was the youth advisor in the United Nations, but I've not seen him in Addis Ababa. So this is disconnect. We talk about the issue of the youth, but the people who are sitting to make decisions, uh, the issue of the youth, they are not there. And even those ministers, they are illiterate technologically. They don't have the Facebook, uh, YouTube, or all these things so they can engage with the youth. So uh, what are we talking here? But the question becomes the main question that we need to address. What are the causes of this marginalization, inclusions of the women and the youth? Take South Sudan, Zimbabwe, Uganda. The president is excluding the ethnic other groups from the governing system of the country. So what chances are the youth and the women have even to come in the table and make a decisions? Maybe we need to think of how can the UN address the root causes of the war that letting youth to cross the Mediterranean, the insecurity, but actually we're dealing with the symptoms but not the real issue of the governments that creating this instability for the youth to run away, to create in, um, inclusions in the economy, social, and politically, I think the issue should be how can the UN address the inst war, the conflict, and the P5 that actually fueling and giving arms to these countries, to these regimes, to stay in power, to persecute, to criminalize the citizens. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ode, and I work for Oxfam. Thank you so much for the presentations. I think. The presentations in general do a really good job at showing the role of youth in peace processes, in development processes, and I think it's quite clear to everyone the importance of partnering with youth, including youth, and investing in youth. The study talks a little bit about the internal barriers that some of these alternative youth organizations face with regards to receiving and managing funds. But there are also internal barriers that exist within international non-governmental organizations and with donor uh, countries with regards to funding alternative youth organizations, which often are informal. So we're not talking about registered not-for-profits or non-governmental organizations. And so my question would be, what would be your concrete policy proposals to instances such as Global Affairs Canada to shift its development model to be able to support these development processes and be able to invest in youth-led initiatives and organizations. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll take one more comment and then we'll turn the, um, the floor back to, the, to our panelists. Thank you. Um, my name is Josephine. I am a um, doctoral student at the University of Kent um, who, and I'm kind of moving here in Canada, so it's great to hear what you guys are doing. Um, my research is mostly about civil society and how um, local civil society relates to global civil society. And um, so I suppose my question is for Graham. <laughs> um, and that is, 
how, um, and I, I don't mean this in an academic way, but how do you um, manage to collect data from the youth that are not reachable? So I suppose you, you mean those who are in the village, far, far away in the village. How do you get to collect information from them um, without relying on the um, NGOs that are located in the city and which tend to be um, biased, ethnically biased sometimes, um, or maybe most of the times in conflict situations. So how do you bridge that gap? Um, that's, that's really my question. So I'm not questioning you there, but I'm just wondering how we can really um, assess this um, this knowledge and, and, and how we can move forward and make sure that those who are far, far away uh, are also included. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, those are all really um, interesting questions. And I'm going to just turn back to the panelists now to see um, who would like to um, uh, address some of those questions. So there's actually a lot in there. Um, there's the issue of um, sort of the sliding scale of, um, a, of what defines a youth um, in different contexts in Africa um, and, uh, and, and what the implications are of that. Um, the very clear question of how is this resolution actually different um, than other UN Security Council resolutions? Um, the causes of exclusion and uh, how do we actually get at some of these root causes of exclusion when sometimes they're very um, politically driven in specific countries and so this actually has the function of driving a wedge in so what are some of the solutions around that some questions around in um, managing funds um, internal barriers of managing <laughs> funds but also practices that we see replicated in international ngos amongst bilateral donors, et cetera. So very concrete question on like, how do we actually shift our international development model towards youth when we're facing things like that? And then finally, um, you know, how do we bridge some of these gaps that we see that, uh, that spring up between youth and other elements related to intersectionality, other groups within society, um, be they ethnic groups or religious groupings, et cetera. So there's a lot in there. So I would open the floor to any of the commenters who would like to um, to answer those. I think there were one or two questions that were directed directly at uh, Graham and also um, to, to Bernadette. So Graham, maybe we'll give you the floor first. Sure. Well, go, go, I, I can talk about the reason. Go for it. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I'm going to talk about it, but go, I think no, no, maybe the funding also. Okay. <laughs> Um, so on your question about how uh, resolution 2250 and 2419 are different from other resolutions, um, as you probably all know, um, intergovernmental resolutions very much tend to repeat what has been said in other resolutions it's called agreed language, which leads to this um, um, result that a lot of these resolutions indeed read the same. And that's actually exactly because they're referencing what's already been said in other resolutions. What is groundbreaking with 2250 is that it is full of what we call new language in a way that's very atypical for the Security Council. Some of the language that's in 2250 comes directly from young people. A few months before uh, the, the Council adopted the resolution, there was a very big global forum on youth peace and security uh, hosted by Jordan in Amman. Um, and there was a declaration adopted by young peace builders on youth peace and security demanding the Council to adopt a resolution and telling the Council this is what the resolution should talk about. It should talk about prevention, it should talk about participation, it should talk about protection, etc. And some of the text that is in 2250 comes directly from that declaration. So this is really um, uh, uh, noticeable and extraordinary. I have to say that 2419 um, has much less new language. It's more a repetition of already approved language, uh, but it also created these cross-references with other agendas such as sustaining peace, as I mentioned before. Um, on the question of funding, um, that's a very important question, something that we discussed a lot with young people through the consultation process. And in the study, we have a series of recommendations around uh, funding mechanisms. Um, it is very challenging for youth-led organizations who often are not organized 
organizations, their movement initiatives are very informal. They might not have a bank account, might not be registered by the government because it's too dangerous for them to be registered. So how do you make funds trickle down to them is a very big challenge. Big donors are typically not at all set up to do that because they have requirement, uh, requirements that um, local organizations or groups will not meet. So external audit reports, a minimum annual budget that is um, uh, way too high, etc. Um, so there are a number of ways to go around that. One way um, is um, for um, funds to open a dedicated funding window. That's what the UN Peace Building Fund has done and open a youth promotion initiative, which is a funding window on youth and peace building, um, really calling for civil society organizations to apply. Um, that's something that other donors, that's one of the recommendations in the study to look at these specific windows. It doesn't solve, though, the question of how the funds can trickle down to smaller organizations. Another model that's quite efficient that many young people brought up in consultation was to have um, umbrella funds or granting mechanism through um, uh, international or national NGOs that can be better equipped to give smaller grants than you know UN or bilateral donors might be able to do. It is important though for these types of mechanisms, again something that was raised by young people, that they're very clear accountability lines in place and that because young people felt that the risk with these types of mechanisms is that their work can then be used by a bigger organization to raise funds and give itself visibility. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Cecile. Graham, over to you. So, so, I mean, to touch on the on the question of the resolution and how different it is, um, I won't I won't add, uh, well, I won't repeat what Cecile said, but I'll add one dimension to it, which is a cautionary note. Um, and that is, and Cecile referred to 2419, the, the follow-up resolution, and said it's a little bipolar in its approach because it's partly talking about youth participation and inclusion, particularly within uh, peace processes and formal peace processes. And if, I think that that's very important as long as we recognize that young people's operate peace building outside of the room um, and in wider society is critical to any role they play uh, in peace processes. But as an aside, um, there was a lot of celebration at the fact that uh, 74 member states participated in the open debate when we presented the Progress Study to Security Council. There was a lot of celebration about 2419 as a follow-up resolution for the reasons that I think were raised, that this gives young people around the world something to peg their issues to and advocates to connect to. And I think it's, the importance of this is, in, is not in dispute. But we do need to recognize that that doesn't imply change in the way in, the, in which the majority of member states and, and leaders necessarily view this. Because many people were still coming to the table to say, we really support this resolution because it's a fantastic way to fight terrorism and because it's a fantastic way to counter violent extremism. And actually, young people were saying, please stop talking about us as terrorists and extremists and start listening to other dimensions. So that, I think, is still there. And we can't afford to be naive that these are resolutions that give us a platform, but they remain politically a reference point for a contested political battle over how young people are seen. And, and we shouldn't ignore that. Again, on the funding issue, I think Cecile's made the critical point. Um, I, you know, we discovered through the, the survey undertaken of youth-led peacebuilding organizations that the expectations and needs, the, the political culture of youth-led organizations is very different, and we have to adapt to that. They're very often volunteer-driven. They're very often tiny budgets. They're very often um, uh, high-risk endeavors. Young people are innovating and taking risk and are disruptive in creative and peaceful ways. Ways. And it's difficult for us to think about ways of investing in this that are not, you know, the, the, within the exi within existing systems. So young people are crying out for more funding, for the ability to scale up their work, for better ways to evaluate the impact of their work, for professionalizing the youth peace building field, and all of these are legitimate concerns. All of them demand, and there's a, a little piece in the study which says, you know, a conflict-sensitive or do-no-harm approach must make us recognize that we can also, this is not a disincentive to funding. This is about saying smart funding and increased smart funding into the sector demands that we're mindful of the dangers 
that throwing money at this, we can pollute these institutions, that professionalizing, we can undermine some of the critical voluntarism, that um, you know, demanding evaluations that are about log frames may actually undermine youth innovation and risk taking. So as long as we're mindful of those do no harm conversations, we can invest more smartly in this. We can get the money to young people in the right ways and we can relieve them of some of those pressures. Um, and just and just to say the one thing, I mean, the political, the political battles continue. I mean, this issue of as the mean age of African leaders gets older and the youth population is gets younger, we also recognise that many of those African leaders came to power on the back of youth movements themselves, but are not particularly prone to extending the same courtesy to the subsequent youth cohort. So the, the reality of what I think we heard on this panel about the way in which people will manipulate what peace means and manipulate young people were saying participation and inclusion is not unconditional. We don't want to participate in systems of patronage and corruption. We don't want to participate as symbols where we're being manipulated for political purposes. They were frustrated at the fact that the only time they're asked to participate and wave flags is often when their political leaders say it's time to wave the flags on our behalf. And so there's a realism to this and an understanding of what meaningful inclusion and participation means. And that goes to this last question, which I think is a constant challenge. And it was one that I was very gratified in every consultation. Young people in the room were saying, are we all here? Is representative politics adequate when youth is a microcosm of the whole society? How do we circumnavigate that? And that's not just in, um, in an urban-rural divide in conflict-affected societies. It's also about the gendered character of the digital divide. When we often say, well, we've got new and creative mechanisms for young people's voice, we have to be very careful we don't miss the, the way in which that can also be new, you know, form new patterns of exclusion. I don't think there's a simple answer to it other than the critical need to be aware of it. The gratifying thing was that in every consultation, young people themselves were saying, do we represent everyone? Is everyone in this room? How do we broaden the space? And the core message in the study, which was young people themselves saying, we should not speak up until we listen down. We should not speak out until we listen in, I think is better than up down because it sounds hierarchical. So, you know, just, just to say, I think that uh, it's the awareness of that dilemma that we have to embrace rather than say we've solved it. Great, thanks. Um, just like to also um, open the floor to any of our other um, commenters who'd like to add to that. Bernadette, did you have a, a point? Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I, I even alluded to uh, the issue of uh, political exclusion and marginalization uh, of the youth in my presentation. But one thing uh, to be noted here, Africa is changing. Uh, youth activism, youth voice is getting really loud. And it's getting very difficult actually uh, for the ruling elites to suppress uh, the youth voice. They, that tension and struggle uh, all the time throughout the continent uh, between the, uh, the, 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 the governors and the, uh, the electorate, the citizens of which majority are youth. Even if you look at the uh, statistics. For example, in my own country, Tanzania, 57% of voters, registered voters in the last election, 2015, were the youth of the age between 18 and 35. And even Zimbabwe, the last election, 60% of registered voters were also the youth. So the youth, the, the, the participation of the youth in political process is actually increase, increasing. Even with regards to the uh, youth joining uh, becoming member of parliament, uh, members of council, becoming uh, members of cabinet. Actually, the number is also increasing, although the increase is in a slow pace. But we see a lot of young people becoming politicians, young politicians in South Africa, in Uganda, in Kenya, uh, even in, uh, in Tanzania, and in many other uh, African countries. But also based on our own study that we are doing, uh, we find a lot of uh, youth organizing at the local level. For example, our study deals with the, uh, a network, I mean, community uh, organized uh, security groups. And the majority of members in these community organized uh, groups are the youth, majority of them. So that's why I find this study to be uh, very relevant in terms of actually pointing out that majority of youth are actually engaged in other very peaceful activities, so to speak, 
rather than you know in, in violent extremism and, and, and terrorism. But this does not mean that we should ignore the fact that also uh, a number of youth are being uh, manipulated and uh, attracted to do you know to engage in, in violence. So it's it's an alarm for, for all of us. Just to pick up on that, I think. Um, yeah, as one of two UN agencies that are headquartered in Africa, you're right, that Africa is certainly changing and the voice of, of youth is, is way more prominent. One very practical is a direct result of uh, Somalia adopting Resolution 250 uh, has been, for the first time in Somalia, national youth policy has been you know, achieved uh, and, and was launched last year. And this looks at every institution and how they're going to, even within the procurement policies of, of the national policy, how can youth be a part of those procurement processes and included in actual, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, being you know meaningfully employed uh, as a result? Um, it's also led to uh, something that the, the federal government uh, it will launch in the in, in the coming year, 2020, is youth parliament. Uh, for the first time, Somalia is going to launch a youth parliament where parliamentarians are going to be partnered with elected officials from their constituents. Um, you know, the question uh, that was asked by a colleague from Oxfam in terms of investments and, um, you know, I, I think Cecile answered, you know, what the, what the um, uh, outcomes of the report were, but very tangibly, UN Habitat has been investing in urban youth fund for the last uh, 15 years. So we have a, a window that's open. Uh, we've reduced the barrier in terms of what the expectations are. We're not asking for young people to manage funds of $2 million in order to qualify. Uh, but we have this very tangible uh, way of, of directing resources to young people at a very uh, concrete level. Um, so, and, and we've actually evaluated uh, where we've invested. Uh, and so there's a report out. If you check our website and just Google Urban Youth Fund, you'll see the results from the last five to ten years. Uh, and, and this is how we've been able to get money on the ground in Colombia to very vulnerable groups. Uh, we also work through uh, other organizations that you know take the money, but again, being very mindful that uh, you know, those realities are there in terms of raising the profile of larger agencies and getting the money on the backs of youth, uh, and that's something to be mindful of. So very practically, I think that those are really tangible ways, and I think we really need to think through how uh, traditionally we fund it. So again, this is the, the um, you know, the exclusion of, of, of young people in terms of the way that we, we trickle resources down, and I think these are honest questions we need to ask as agencies, uh, as international donors, and as member states. I would like to answer the, uh, the funding question as well. Um, one model that has worked from our experience um, as well as the model of organizational mentorship, uh, where, uh, wherein funding um, sources, whether that's uh, <laughs> you know, foundations or governments, take a bigger risk in investing in smaller organizations with very little track record. By, by, by having an organizational mentor, in this case, it would be an international NGO or a bigger civil society organization that has the capacity to do so, to be able to mentor the organization and to walk them through the fund management, the project management parts, uh, parts of it. Um, in terms of Global Affairs Canada um, investments, um, it's uh, one thing that we've been struggling with, but qu working quite hard is uh, having a... Uh, Work a Canada leading a network of youth peace and security at least at the regional level, um, and that network is, is is going to be more than talking and, and and outlining the priorities, but really exchanging ideas and best practices. And we have as Canadians lots to share, but we also have a lot to learn from our American counterparts or counterparts from the Americas rather. Um, and so uh, working with Global Affairs Canada, so international organizations, and um, public safety in the Department of National Defense and facilitating that youth exchange um, that we've seen to be very successful in some manifestations we've done, uh, namely in Peru and Colombia with the UN Association in Canada. I'll just, Carl, I'll just add one more thing to that. So. Uh, in relation to the funding as well, so uh, the Public Safety Canada is sort of, we've made the acknowledgement that moving from model programs and such like that ignores the distinct challenges that affect many of these communities, especially in low capacity uh, communities, indigenous in particular. So um, we've become more innovative in the way that we are prescribing uh, our funding applications. Uh, what we're asking applicants to do is sort of come up with something innovative. 
sort of we're not going to prescribe something where you have to fit the box, so to speak. But tell us your challenges, and we'll do our best to sort of work through those together and hopefully guide people to, to peace and security in those communities as well. Thanks, mm -hmm. thanks, thanks very much. And yeah. I'd, I'd like to thank all of the speakers this morning. Um, I'd like to give you a, a round of applause, which I think is a really interesting panel.